The United States wouldn't be the world power it is today without its enormous manufacturing achievements. Historically, those accomplishments sometimes came with a deadly price, however, since safety guidelines were either lax or non-existent. But all that began to change one January day in 1919 after an industrial disaster in the city of Boston. That tragedy and its complicated legacy are the topics of this week's Real History. The north end of Boston in the early 1900s was one of the most congested neighborhoods, not just in the United States, but in the entire world. One historian likened its population density to that of Calcutta, India. There were about 40,000 people, most of them Italian immigrants, in about a one mile square of geographic space. And also an enormously congested commercial area. Most of the shipping that went to Europe and up and down the East Coast left from that north end waterfront area. In the midst of all this congestion, there was an enormous steel tank, five stories high, about 50 feet tall, and it held about 2.3 million gallons of molasses. And that molasses was brought up from Cuba and the West Indies and Puerto Rico on huge steamers and offloaded into this steel tank. It was distilled into industrial alcohol and then further processed and used in the production of high explosives, munitions, TNT, nitroglycerin, things like that for the war effort. So the company that operated the tank, U.S. Industrial Alcohol, had as some of its large clients the French and British governments. Once the U.S. gets into the war in 1917, the United States government becomes a huge client of the molasses tank owner. From the first day of the tank's construction, it leaked molasses. It leaked so frequently and so regularly that children would come onto the tank site and scoop up molasses that had pooled around the base of the tank. And then after molasses deliveries occurred, the tank would moan and groan. It almost took on uh, a persona as it made these kinds of sounds. There was a feeling among the workers in the area, among the residents in the area, that indeed something was not quite right. January 15th, 1919 was about a 40 degree day in Boston. Two days earlier, it had been two degrees. In Boston, that's known as a January thaw. Lots of activity on the waterfront. It was one of those days that Bostonians kind of looked forward to the spring. A Boston police patrolman by the name of Frank McManus was making his routine beat walk when he heard what he described later as a tremendous rumbling grinding sound and the rat-tat-tat of what sounded like machine gun bullets. And he saw this huge molasses tank basically collapsing and disintegrating in front of his eyes. The rat-tat-tat with the thousands of rivets pulling away and he saw it disgorging its contents of molasses. He had the presence of mind to utter, send all available rescue personnel immediately. There's a wave of molasses coming down Commercial Street. The wave came and it came hard, about 35 miles an hour at the outset, about 35 feet high. It leveled off to about 20 feet high and about 160 feet wide. And think of this as almost a tidal wave kind of event where the molasses scooped up everything in its path. It scooped up people, it scooped up domestic animals, it scooped up buildings, houses, freight cars that ran on Commercial Street, and it turns the whole, the North End Yard into kindling. The toll of the molasses flood was great. There were 21 people killed, uh, 150 people injured. The Boston Molasses Flood really commands a lot of coverage. It knocks off the front page, for example, the Prohibition Amendment, which is ratified the day after the flood. So in terms of news coverage, it's a very, very big story. In terms of sort of what you might consider the outrage uh, of the Boston political hierarchy, there's some initial outrage the first day or two, but after that, not very much the nature of where this happened in a very poor North End neighborhood that was made up primarily of Italian immigrants. These were not important people who were killed. These were not important people who were injured. These were not important people whose neighborhood was impacted. 
The Great Boston Molasses Flood spawns an enormous civil lawsuit that follows 119 plaintiffs in a essentially a class action suit, one of the largest in the country to that point, and really one of the largest to this day. It took three years of testimony, a thousand witnesses, 1,500 exhibits, a civil suit brought against the company that owned the tank. It was discovered during the course of the court case that the tank was uh, rushed to completion, that the steel that was delivered for the tank did not meet the specs and were indeed much thinner than the tank had called for. After this lengthy civil suit, uh, the judge in the case, Hugh W. Ogden, rules against the company. When the judge in the case rules against United States Industrial Alcohol in 1925, it's the first major court decision against a large United States corporation. And if you put a stake in the ground right at that point and move, I think there's no question that the entire relationship between business and government is changed. Government has much more to say in the way of regulations and restrictions on big business. And it's the molasses flood case that really sets the tone for that.